morning's reading comes from Luke chapter 16, verses 19 to 31. I'm reading from the NIV Bible. There was a rich man who was dressed in purple and fine linen and lived in luxury every day. At his gate laid a beggar named Lazarus, covered with sores and longing to eat that which fell from the rich man's table. Even the dogs came to lick his sores. The time came when the beggar died and the angels carried him to Abraham's side. The rich man also died and was buried. In hell, where he was in torment, he looked up and saw Abraham far away. And Lazarus was by his side. So he called to him, Father Abraham, have pity on me and send, send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue because I am in agony in this fire. But Abraham replied, Son, remember that in your lifetime you received your good things while Lazarus received the bad things? But now he is comforted here and you are in agony. And besides all this, between us and you, a great chasm has been fixed. so that those who want to come from here to you cannot, nor can anyone cross over from there to us. He answered then, I beg of you, Father, send Lazarus to my father's home, for I have five brothers. Let him tell them, so that they will not also come to this place of torment. Abraham replied, they have Moses and the prophets, let them listen to them. No, Father Abraham, he said, but if someone from the dead goes to them, they will repent. He said to them, if they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, they will not be convinced, even if someone rises from the dead. This is the word of the Lord. Join me in prayer. Jesus, we know that you are here with us this morning. You are present with your people. And Lord, we know you are about to speak to us. It is not just one of the Sundays that we just come and sit in the church. But this morning we come with an open heart with a sense of expectancy that you are going to speak to us and change our heart and our lives. We come before you humbly, before your word that created the whole universe. As you have created the world with your words, we ask that you recreate our hearts with your words. May the word of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be pleasing in your sight. In the name of our Redeemer and Lord, we pray these things. Amen. But this morning, let's just start with a joke. There are two friends, Max and Mark. They made a deal that whoever died first would come back and tell the other what heaven looks like. After some time, Max died. True to his word, he made a first contact. Max said, Mark, it's me, Max. Mark said, oh, Max, I have been so worried. Where have you been? What is it like there? Max replied, well, I will describe it. I get a good night's sleep. I get up at sunrise. I take a walk and have a good breakfast. After breakfast, I relax a bit. Then I take a nap. 
Then I wake up and enjoy the scenery. Soon it's, it's time for lunch. And they give me a lot of vegetables here. Then after lunch, I take a little nap again. Then I get up refreshed. Then I eat dinner. Then after dinner, I sleep. Every day, it's like this here. Mark said, oh, Max, that must be great. It's good to hear you're doing so well in heaven after you died. Then Max replied, who said I was in heaven? I am a cow on a farm in New South Wales. What do you believe about the afterlife? Many people in our modern world think that when we die, everything is over. But Christianity offers another way of thinking about the afterlife. The Bible elaborates on the afterlife. When we closely look at what the Bible says about it, we soon realize that the Bible actually helps us prepare for the moment of death. A former Korean minister of culture, Dr. Oh Young Lee, who is also a university professor in literature, said this. Until we accept the reality of death, we never truly live. When we live as if we live in this world forever, we become destructive to ourselves and others. If Hitler and Stalin had known that they would die one day like everybody else, would they have done such an evil thing? Until we accept that we will die one day, we never truly live. I know this is a heavy question, but let me ask you this. Have you ever seriously thought about the afterlife? Have you ever seriously thought about death? If yes, how does your view on the afterlife affect your life here and now. For the last few weeks, we've been journeying with a sermon series titled Honest Questions, Honest Answers. And we've looked at some of the Christian ideas that people in the modern world struggle with. Today's topic is the last one of the series. And this might be the most controversial and yet most interesting one to look at. Today's topic is about the afterlife. We ask if the God of the Bible is loving, why does he not say everyone is destined to heaven? How can a loving God send people to hell? This morning, we will look at this topic based on the passage read to us earlier. Today's passage is a parable. As most of you, most of you know, the parable basically means a made-up story that has a message. Today's story is what Jesus told the religious leaders of the day, and it answers three questions about the afterlife. We will explore them one by one this morning. The first one is, what is the Christian perspective on the afterlife? The second, does God really send people to hell? And lastly, how does the Christian understanding of the afterlife affect our lives here and today? Let us begin. What is the Christian perspective on the afterlife? Last week, I, as I was preparing the sermon, I thought about the time when I first thought about death. It was when I was 13 and my uncle passed away. He had a very complicated and serious surgery on his brain and he went into a coma. Our family were told that he did not have much to live. And all of us went to see him and say our goodbyes. He was in intensive care, and we, one by one, said goodbye to him. But he did not respond. Among all relatives, my mother was the only Christian person in the room. And when it was his, uh, her turn, turn, she sat near the bed, bedside. She, she, she sat near the bed head. And she started gently saying these words to my uncle's ears. Brother, if you see Jesus, follow him. You can believe him. If you see Jesus, follow him. He will lead you to heaven. He will lead you to heaven. 
Then to everyone's surprise, he came out of the coma and said to my mother, thank you, I will. Then he passed away shortly. He had been an atheist his whole life, but he went peacefully. Watching this, my aunt came to faith. And I think it was the moment that I first ever thought that there is more beyond this life. Jesus' parable in the text tells us this one feature of the afterlife. It is that people are conscious after death. In the story, there are two men, a rich man and Lazarus. In life, Lazarus was a beggar, and after he died, he went to heaven named Abraham's side in the text. And the rich man went to a place called Hades, which in English translates to hell. What is interesting in the story is that the rich man says that there is agony in Hades. Hades, is that how you say Hades? Hades. In other words, the biblical view is that when we die, we still have consciousness. It is not like when we die, everything is gone, but we have what we call soul. And this parable also tells us this. Our soul faces two destinies after death. They are heaven and hell. Then, biblically, what is heaven and hell? Heaven is what Jesus called paradise. Jesus said to the thief on the cross, this day you will be with me in paradise. The Apostle Paul said he also had a vision of a paradise. Heaven is where God rules and his presence is realized. It is where the angels are. It is where the departed souls are until their bodies are resurrected at the second coming of Christ. Then, what is the biblical view on hell? A few days ago, I read a funny story. This theologian said people often ask him what he believes about hell. He said he almost always replies this way. Well, one thing that I believe is that the biblical imagery of hellfire is metaphorical. Then people would go, Phew, that is good. Then he always responds to the people like this. It is metaphorical for probably something a lot worse than fire. Then people go, huh? The Greek word Hades or hell refers to the underworld which Hebrews believed in and named Sheol. In the ancient time, Hebrews believed that when wicked people died, their spirits went to Sheol. And there was a reason Hebrews believed that the spirits of wicked people suffer fire in Sheol. In Jerusalem, there was a, a small valley named Gehenna. It was a horrible place where people, including children, were burned to death. The ancient Hebrews thought that the underworld would be a horrible place like that. This background tells us that hellfire is most likely metaphorical, but the Bible holds a clear view on the afterlife. And Jesus talks about it consistently in the New Testament. There are over 162 references in the New Testament alone which talks about hell, and over 70 of them were said by Jesus. Then, let's move on to the next question. Does God really send people to hell? What do you think? Well, in the story, we, see, we don't see anything that tells us that God sends people to hell. Before we dive into the text, I thought you might find this illustration very helpful. In the book, The Chronicles of Narnia, there is a boy named, named Eustace. Eustace is a very selfish and greedy boy in the story. Eustace and the, and the other children travel on a ship and camp to an island. There, Eustace discovers a dragon stand filled with a all kinds of treasures. Then Eustace decides to put on one of the br bracelets he finds among the treasures, and he falls asleep. 
Sometime later, Eustace awakes and realizes that he has become a dragon. His greed has made him what he feared. In desperation, he goes to grab a rope and begins to try to tear the dragon's skin off. Yet no matter what he tries to do, Eustace cannot remove the skin of the brute beast he has become. The boy became a dragon. It is his greed that turned him, to, turned him into a beast. Now, doesn't this children's story sound very similar to Jesus' parable today? You see, what sent the rich to hell was his greed, not God. In Jesus' day, kings wore purple clothes. The man was, man was as rich as a king, but he did not have any empathy for others, even when they were starving to death. He only knew himself. What does Abraham say to him? He says, in your lifetime, you received your good things. In other words, in his lifetime, the rich man only did what was good for him. He was, he was a self-centered and prideful man. Now, there is something very interesting about this parable, and you have probably noticed this. In the story, Jesus names the poor man Lazarus, but the rich man does not have any name. The commentators say that the contrast is deliberate. As some of you already know, in the Hebrew culture, a name refers to one's identity. Now, you see what Jesus is saying here. Here, Jesus is saying greed has not only blinded the man, but also took his identity. Just like the boy who became a dragon. Hear what the rich man says, even in Hades. He says, send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue. The rich man still cannot see it. Even in Hades, he disdains Lazarus. He treats Lazarus contemptuously. He still thinks he is superior to Lazarus. He is completely out of touch with the reality. Do you see how his greed has swallowed up his identity? Now, that is a fire. Losing sensibility or losing identity is a hell. In the story, we do not read in the story, we do not see anywhere that God has sent the rich man to hell. The man sent himself to hell. C.S. Lewis, in his book, Mere Christianity, talks about how hell begins in one's life. He said this, Christianity asserts that every living, every individual human being is going to live forever. Now, there are many good things which would not be worth, worth bothering about if, we, if I were going to live only 70 years, but which I had better bother about very seriously if I am going to live forever. Perhaps my bad temper or my greed or my jealousy is gradually getting worse, so gradually that the increase in 70 years will not be very noticeable but it might be absolute hell in a million years. In fact, if Christianity is true, hell is a precisely correct technical term for what it would be. Hell begins with a grumbling mood, always complaining, always blaming others, but you are still distinct from it. You may even criticize it in yourself and wish you could stop it. But there may be they, but there may come a day when you can no longer. Then there will be no you left to criticize a mood or even to enjoy it, but just the grumble, grumble itself or the greed itself or jealousy itself, going on forever like a machine. It is not a question of God sending us to hell. In each of us, there is something growing up which with which will of itself be hell unless it is nipped in the bud. Then C.S. Lewis, in another book, 
the great divorce summarizes it this way. All that are in hell choose it. Without that self-choice, there could be no hell. I know this sounds a little bit harsh, but please continue with me. There is something wonderful coming up. In life, we face suffering. When suffering continues, we call it hell. There are two kinds of suffering in this life. One is what is inflicted by external factors, and the other is self-inflicted. When suffering is self-inflicted and we say it is like a hell, what we probably mean is this. I left my problem as it is and let it grow and continue. And the problem is now out of my control. It could be an addiction. It could be anger that has turned into bitterness. It could be a sense of shame or despondency that turned into self-hatred. It could be fear of something that turned into the problem of isolation. When we go through the self-inflicted suffering, what would God say? Would He cruelly say, you brought it onto yourself, you deserve that suffering? No. Look at what Jesus calls the rich man in the story. He calls him son. There is a deep sense of sadness as he talks about this man. The God of the Bible does not want anyone to perish. He is a God of salvation, not destruction. The other day, I heard a pastor talk about his ministry. One Sunday, after this pastor finished the church service of the day, he was resting in his office. Then someone brought in a young lady. She looked very nervous and she looked very anxious and her eyeballs moved vigorously. Then the pastor noticed that she was captivated by evil spirits. He was a Methodist church's pastor. He had never encountered any evil spirits before in his life. At first, he panicked, but as he started praying, one word came to his mind. The word was abortion. The pastor asked the lady if the word meant anything to her. Then she started crying and said she had four abortions. The pastor gently explained how mistreatment of life is a sin, and he led her to repentance. Then the woman said, all other evil spirits left her, but there is one left. The pastor was confused and did not know what to do anymore. Then another word came to his mind. That was forgiveness. The pastor gently asked the woman if forgiveness meant anything to her, assuming that the woman was still holding a grudge against the four men who abandoned her. But the woman said, Pastor, I know you are talking about the man that I had a relationship with, but I do not hate them. I have moved on. The pastor was greatly puzzled. After a few moments, he then asked, then, sister, do you have anyone that you want to murder? Then the woman became tearful and said, Yes, it is me. I do not want to live anymore. I cannot forgive myself. How can I forgive myself after what I have done? Then the pastor looked into her eyes and said, Sister, do you know you are God's child? who Jesus has purchased by his blood. Jesus has paid your debts. He died for your sin. Though you may, not, you may not be able to forgive yourself, would you believe in God's forgiveness of your sin? The woman said yes, and she was free. In the parable, there is something very powerful. Lazarus is a great name. It was a common name in Jesus' name, Jesus' day. And it is the equivalent of the Hebrew name Elzar. Do you know what Elzar means? 
It means whom God has helped. Now think about this with me. Why do you think Jesus chose that name? How did Lazarus go to heaven? How did he become free? He was a beggar. At death, because Lazarus did not have anything, he called upon God. He held on to God. He asked God would come and help him. You know, when facing a problem that burns our heart like hellfire, such as addiction, bitterness, or unforgiving heart, we cannot save ourselves. We need God's help, and we need God's power, and most of all, we can be assured that God can be trusted and He wants to help. This morning, if you are struggling with the scars in your heart, a sense of shame or sin, and yet have not truly asked God to come and help, would you turn to God? Would you turn to Him? The only way that we become truly liberated is the blood of Jesus Christ. The only way that we become truly liberated is the blood of Jesus Christ. In the last part of the parable, Jesus leaves us with something very powerful and interesting. The rich man asks Abraham to send a message to his five brothers from heaven that they may not perish. But Jesus says this, if they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, they will not be convinced even if someone rises from the dead. In other words, Jesus is saying, no matter how many signs he shows us and how spectacular they are, unless we believe in him, his saving power is irrelevant. Friends, do you know that we now have with us the one who rose from the dead? It is Jesus Christ. But do you believe in him and that he has come to save and the and has the power to set us free. Do you believe that his blood was shed for you? Do you believe that his blood was shed for you specifically? This morning, what do you say about your life? Are there bitterness, addiction, unforgiving heart, self-hatred or pride in it? Let me gently say this to you. You and I cannot save ourselves from them. But look to Jesus Christ. Look at his cross. As Psalm 121 says, Lift up your eyes to Calvary. Where does our help come from? Our help comes from the Lord. The Apostle Creed says this about the cross. It says Jesus descended into hell. That is how far he went to set us free. He loves you, my friend. You mean the world to him. You are worthy to him. You mean the world to him. If Jesus has gone through hell for you, he will save you from any kind of fire in your life. As we finish, let me read to you how the story of the boy who became a dragon ends. It is beautiful. It will be the story of some of us this morning. As some of you might know, in this story, lion is Jesus Christ. Let me read it to you. One night, in the midst of his pain and frustration, Eustace encounters a huge lion who tells the boy to follow it to a high mountain well. Eustace longs to bathe his aching foot in the cold water, but the lion tells him he must undress first. It seems silly to Eustace because dragons do not wear clothes. But then he remembers that dragons, like snakes, cast their skins. So Eustace scratches his skin, and the scales begin falling off. And soon, his whole skin peels away, but 
when he put his foot in the water, he sees that it is just as rough and scaly as before. He continues scratching at the second dragon skin and realizes there is yet another underneath. Finally, the lion says, you will have to let me undress you. You'll have to let me undress you. Eustace is afraid of the lion's claws, but desperate to get in the water. The first tear is painfully deep as the lion begins to peel away the skin, but with a rough mess of the dragon skin now cut away, the lion holds Eustace and throws him into the water. Initially, the water stings, but soon it is perfectly delicious. Eustace swims without pain, for he is a boy again. He is a boy again. Let us pray. Jesus, we come to you this morning. When we are helpless, you are helpful. It is you from whom I find my help. Father, we bring to you with open heart our problems, our issues, our addictions, sadness, depression, self-hatred, doubt, all these things. We've been trying to tear it off us. But Lord, you're saying to us, it is you who can help us. Jesus, help us today. We are the Lazarus this morning. We need your grace. We need your power. We need your love. And on the cross, you said, it is finished. I am here. My blood is shed for you. Be free. Be free. Be free. Be free in Jesus' name. In your name we pray. Amen.